Quinn. I'm in recovery. Um, <clears throat> so I am a content creator and motivational speaker on social media, and this is the first time that I've actually told my story in front of a, a group this big. So I'd like to just say there's probably going to be moments where I'm out of breath. There's probably going to be moments where I get nervous. Um, I'm probably going to be looking at my screen like 90% of the time. So just be aware. Um, it's not that I'm I'm not trying to be rude or anything. I just have like not been in front of a live group, and so this is like my way of like getting rid of my anxiety. So anyway, um, <clears throat> first thing um, I just like to introduce myself. I'm, my name is Quinn. This is my little sister Olive. Um, I owe a huge a huge part of my getting sober to my sister. She's helped me time and time again. She's always provided a safe space for me. Um, and without her, I wouldn't be where I am today. So all of, you know, I love you and thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> so I'll just get right into it. So a little background, I was born in France. My parents divorced when I was three years old and she moved my brother and I to the States with the backpacks that we had on and the clothes we were wearing. We also didn't speak a single word of English and I remember having to ask for cigarettes at the gas station for my mom or like write out her checks. This was like back in the 90s when checks were a thing. Um, and because I learned English much quicker than she did. I was only like four years old and I picked it up really quickly. The earliest memory that I have here in America was my first day of preschool. In France, we raise both of our hands when we need to go to the bathroom. You raise one hand for a question, you raise both hands to go to the bathroom. I thought this was universal. This is not a universal sign. And so I'm like probably four or five years old going like this, you know, like I need to pee, but I don't speak English. And the teachers are like, this kid's super excited about first grade. I had a miss. So I don't know why, but my, the, my answer was that I'm just going to stand up and pee where I'm standing. And so I stood up and I peed and there was somebody sitting in front of me. Needless to say, I did not make friends that year. <laughs> uh, when I was five, we moved to a neighborhood. Um, there was like neighborhood kids around me. We went to school together. We hung out together after school and everything. Um, I'm not sure if, if the neighbor, my neighbor, my direct neighbor, his name was Mike. He's probably like three or four years older than me, maybe eight or nine at this time. I'm not sure if he was like experiencing some kind of physical abuse or sexual abuse at home, but the way that he was expressing his love or his you know, care for his friends was through physical touch. And he started molesting and abusing all the kids in the neighborhood. Um, and pretty soon we were all basically molesting each other. We were at six, seven, eight years old. Now, at that time, I don't know if I was too young, you know, I still had, still was learning English, and maybe I was embarrassed or, or ashamed or whatever it was. I didn't communicate properly to my mom and my brother that, you know, I was being touched or whatever, and it kind of got overlooked. When, when I brought it up to them now, in, you know, in, in the present time, they say that they don't remember those things happening or that I, they don't remember me ever saying anything to them about it. So whatever, the, whatever reason it got overlooked or it just didn't get the attention I needed, um, I felt like, I felt very unworthy. I felt like, you know, what had happened to me wasn't worth anybody's attention. Not too long after that started happening, um, I also witnessed another sexual abuse. Uh, I walked in on somebody being raped. And I told the grown-ups, and the grown-ups, you know, I was like, what happened? You know, like I walked in on something, I know something was wrong, but I didn't know what it was. And the, the grown-ups were like, oh no, nothing happened. You know, don't, don't worry about it. I get it, like, how do you tell a six-year-old they just walked in on a rape? But in my mind, after being abused and after witnessing what I witnessed, I just, 
for some reason I thought that that kind of physical touch was okay. As I grew older, I came to realize that what had happened to me was not okay. Um, it took a, a large part of me with them. And, but what hurt me more than being sexually abused was that we all were abusing each other, not knowing what we were doing, and I abused other kids. And that's what hurt me more. Being sexually abused was hard on me, but the thought that I brought that on, that those emotions onto somebody else was really what tormented my, my mind. I was very ashamed. I felt very guilty. I felt worthless and insecure for what happened to me. And I was afraid to talk about it because talking about it also meant admitting what I had done to other people. So I buried it. I suppressed it in the back of my mind and I didn't talk about it for, for over a decade. Over the next eight years, from the, ages, uh, from the age of seven to 15, I switched schools five different times, five completely different districts, different cities, I had to try and make friends, and I was always the weird foreign kid, and I just, I had a really hard time making friends, I had a hard time making connections, and for a child who was already stripped of their confidence, their self-worth, and sense of community and security, it was just, I was very alone and very depressed quite often. Um, I heard through the D.A.R.E. program that if you ever did drugs, ever in your life, your whole life would just come crashing down. You would lose everything that you had, you would lose your house and your job and, and everything. And when I saw people using drugs, they didn't immediately lose everything. And so I was like, oh, well, like that wasn't true. What else, you know, what else about drugs isn't true? And so when I, so I started smoking cigarettes and I started smoking weed and I started to like gain this escape. Now, smoking weed, smoking cigarettes, those weren't the gateway drug. The gateway for me was was the trauma. It wasn't necessarily about the drugs, and I didn't I didn't quite understand that at the, at that time. The reality was that I liked that I was able to escape the torment and the memories, and I liked that drugs made me feel like I could be somebody else because I hated everything about who I was. I liked that drugs made me feel outgoing and talkative, relatable. I felt like I was the center of attention and that's something that I had never been. So I started to escape the torment. I started to mask who I was as often as I possibly could. I chose to use drugs to escape and mask my reality because the other choice was to be somebody that I completely hated. Then the disease started to take over and it no longer became a choice. It became an uncontrollable addiction and my coping mechanism for every single emotion and every single situation that I experienced. I was never, or I never learned the proper coping skills that, that a lot of children are being able to play sports and things like that. I just never, I never did those types of things. I chose drugs because it was an easy option, but it was also my only option that I had, that I had seen up until that point. I chose drugs because I didn't have to deal with the torment. I could just escape it by nodding out. I didn't have to learn people's skills. I could just do coke and be talkative. And I didn't have to deal with the trauma, I could just nod out and escape and not worry about it. And so I continued to use drugs as my coping mechanism for every single thing. A habit is formed in the brain through something called neural plasticity. It's what's happening in your brain when you do something repetitive. When you're playing basketball, you're, or you're, you're playing, um, when you practice anything, and I like to correlate it with basketball, your brain starts to correlate the emotions that you're feeling with like your senses, 
and it starts to build these neurological passages so that you can do them better. So like, I shoot a basketball and I can feel it like slip at the end of my fingers. I know, you know, the more that I do it, the more I just get that memory, you know, that muscle memory going. That's what neuroplasticity is in our brains. It's kind of like muscle memory. So, the exact same thing is happening when we're doing drugs. <coughs> it's a habit. When we use drugs to, to do something, anything, and we correlate it with an emotion, whether it's depression or, or anxiety or anger, our brain automatically starts to build those neurological passages. Hey, I'm upset so I use drugs. And the next time that I'm upset, my brain automatically correlates, well, the last time we were able to use drugs. So let's do that because we liked the effects that we got when we did drugs, but when we did them for this coping mechanism and your brain starts to build that, those neurological passages to say, hey, that's what we did last time, let's do it again because I like the results that we got. When we use drugs, we're releasing a large amount of dopamine, and that dopamine tricks our brains into thinking that because we really enjoy what we're experiencing, we're getting positive results. So my brain started to think that this was the solution, and this is how I achieved this state of happiness, is, by, is through drugs. In the third grade, I got suspended from school because I found my brother's Playboys in the shed. And I brought them to school, and I was letting people look at them for like a dollar. And so I started realizing, like, I don't even have to gain people's skills. I can just, I can just have something that people want, and they'll be attracted to me. So at age 16, I started selling drugs, because I remember that's how I can attract people to me without having to put in the work. I craved that emotional connection, and I didn't know how to make friends. I moved around so much and had my walls up so high from the torment and the torture or the, the abuse that I didn't know how to make friends, I didn't want to make friends, and it was just a vicious cycle of like constant depression. I used drugs as a way to attract people to me so that I didn't have to learn those skills. I got that false sense of camaraderie that people wanted me, they cared about who I was, but the reality was that they didn't care. They only cared about the drugs and what I could provide for them. And I realized that really quickly when I stopped selling drugs and the phone call stopped. I would do crazy things to make people believe that I was an interesting person. I had guns, I sold drugs, I drove nice cars, I bought motorcycles, I had my own place. But all those things when drugs were my main motivator, all those things only attracted the wrong people. Not the wrong people, but the same type of people. The type of person that I was, which was lost, hurt, confused, and didn't have proper coping mechanisms to understand how to deal with life in a positive way. I felt like nobody could love me, and they were only using me for, for what I could provide for them. In 2011, I was selling drugs out of my mom's house, and I had there was nothing in the house. The house was completely empty. It was like a four or five bedroom house. There was nothing in the house except for my bedroom set. And I woke up with, one morning with this terrible pain in my groin, and I was like throwing up everywhere. And I was like, there's something wrong, like something in my stomach. Like, I don't know, something's going on. And so I told my fiance at the time, you have to take me to the hospital. There's something going on, like there's something really wrong. So I go to the hospital and they tell me I have a testicular torsion. And this is where one of your testicles wraps around the other one and starts cutting off the circulation. So they told me like, you have to operate or you're, you're gonna lose your nuts. And I was like, well, operate. I don't wanna lose my nuts. <laughs> so, you know, I told them like, you know, I'm an intravenous drug user. My my veins, for some reason, I use them once and they collapse, like every single time. Still to this day, I have issues going to the hospital because my veins are so bad, um, they're not able to even get me. So that was a real big complication that I've had throughout my life, is just dreading to go to the hospital because I knew even pulling blood was like an ordeal. So anyway, so I go into surgery and 
when you go into surgery, they give you the anesthesia, and to wake you up, they give you adrenaline, and it wakes you up out of that anesthesia. But because I've been doing coke and heroin, the adrenaline and the coke made my my uh, my heart rate skyrocket. My blood pressure was just through the roof. My heart rate just like shot up, and I blew my coronary artery, and I went into cardiac arrest. I was in a coma for five days, and my sister was in Montana. I was living in Utah at the time. My sister was in Montana. My mom was in Georgia. My brother was like a couple cities away. And I wake up from what I remembered was surgery to get the testicular torsion. I wake up, and they tell me, like, you, uh, there was complications. You went into cardiac arrest your coronary artery um, you have the heart of about an 80 year old man and we didn't think that you were gonna make it when I woke up from the coma my sister was there my mom was there my brother was there I was like what's going on they're like well they told us to come say goodbye to you because you like you weren't gonna wake up so they told me that uh, they were gonna they were they gave me about six months to live. I had done so much damage to my body and my heart. They were like, you know, if you, we don't see you making it past six months. So my mom said, you know, if you stay here in Utah, you're gonna, you're gonna die. Like, with, you know, you're, you're gonna die. So like, come spend the next six months with your family. So I flew out to Georgia and I stayed there probably about a month before I was like, you know, I, I just. This is not what I want. I want to numb and escape for the next, for whatever time that I have left. I'm going to live it just like obliterated. So even though I was using and I, was, I went, I moved back to Utah and I started selling dope again, started using again. And even though I was using and selling dope, I kept thinking to myself, like, this is not it for me. I'm, I'm not meant to die at 25. I just kept telling myself, there's no way this is my life path, that I'm gonna die at 25 and not accomplish the damn thing in my life. So, obviously I didn't die. <laughs> uh, not too long after that, I found myself at a rock bottom that I couldn't get out of. My money was gone, my resources were gone, nobody wanted to help me financially, uh, and I had to resort to home invasions and robberies to get my fix on one of my mini scams with my fiance at the time. We got caught by the police and arrested. She was on she was on probation, so she didn't get released, but I got released. And at this point, I was just broken. I lost my partner in crime. My, um, my car got taken away. My mom was like, you can't live at my house anymore. You know, I was living in her empty house in Utah while she was living in Georgia. And she was like, I, like, I'm gonna sell the house, you can't live there anymore. And so I had nowhere to go. And I remember being on the metro, like the tracks is what they call it, in Utah. And I was just riding the tracks up and down the line because I was just, I had nowhere to go. And I was just lost. So I called my mom and I said, look, like, I've had enough, I'm ready to come home. Like, can I come get sober in Georgia? So she allowed me to come to Georgia to get sober, and I was sober for almost a year. Um, I started going to college. I got my own car. I bought a motorcycle. I even started my own cell phone store, and everything on the outside looked really, really good. Like, I had put on, like, an amazing persona in this one year. But... On the inside, I was still broken. I still never dealt with the trauma. I still was suppressing all those memories and, and denying myself of feeling the emotions that I had. I just kept running. So, like I said, on the outside, things were going great, but the thoughts in my mind were still there. I had never healed from the torment. And because my brain had built those neurological passages so strongly, when those memories would come back, my mind would instantly be like, drugs. Like, that's, that's what we know. That's our coping mechanism. So you're depressed, drugs. 
and that's that's sorry I lost my place. Um, the coping mechanisms. Anytime I got depressed, anytime I'd get sober, it was just those neurological passages had been built so strong. It's just like the same neurological passage that says, "Oh, I'm hungry, eat." It's not something that we have to think about. We've just, since we were born, correlated those two emotions. I'm hungry, I eat. And it was the same thing for me. I get depressed, I get angry, I get upset. Whatever it was, drugs was my answer. So because I never learned the proper coping mechanisms of how to deal with my trauma, I didn't have any other answers besides drugs. The trauma became so strong, I gave in and fell back into relapse. I dropped out of college, I lost my business, I traded my motorcycle for drugs, and I soon fell into another rock bottom. If there was one thing that I knew how to do, it was run away from my problems. I used the only coping mechanism that I've been given up until this point, and I ran. I moved to the Caribbean, where my brother lives, on a beautiful island. He gave me a safe space to recover, but I still didn't have the skills. I still didn't know how to heal. And very shortly after, I found the drug, I found where to get drugs. For the next year, I continued to numb myself. It was basically hell in paradise. I don't know if you've ever been to the Caribbean, but for people who live there, it's very, it's very hard. Um, most of their economy is built on tourism and tourism was not doing too well. So there's a lot of crime, a lot of robberies, a lot of just people getting robbed for you know, just walking down the street. Um, I was often sick because dope wasn't e as easily acceptable there as it is here. I'm sorry, accessible there as it is here. But it was accessible enough to where I could get it every few days and still be dope sick all the time. After I hit another rock bottom on the island, I pleaded with my mom, like, let me come back. We had, we had, we had agreed that I would stay in the Caribbean for a year, and I had, I had lied to her up until this point that I had been sober, I had been doing good. I was like, you said I only have to be here for a year, you know, like, can I come back? Um, and she, she said, yeah, you can come back. Um, but I think the only real reason why she let me come back is because I had already set up a job in Atlanta. Um, so I just happened to meet this guy on the beach. I was like, uh, I was selling um, beach chairs, or renting beach chairs. And it just so happens this guy was from Georgia. And I was like, oh cool, I'm from Georgia, or I'm living in Georgia. And he was like, oh, well, if you ever come back to the States, let me know, I'll give you, I'll give you like a, a, a cozy management position. I was like, great. So I told my mom, like, I've got this job out in Atlanta. I can go up there. She's like, great, I'll help you out, you know, get, your, get you a place out there, get you set up, and then you just, you'll, you'll live out there. So the area that I moved to in Atlanta is, was not, a place where you want to try and get sober. Literally four houses down the yard or down the street from me was a place called, that they called the junkyard because it had like all these cars just like broken down in the front yard and they sold crack and heroin there. That was the first time that I actually got addicted to crack. I had been I had been uh, speedballing for for many many years, but. I found the process to break down crack and I started shooting that up and that was just like, that was a massively different experience. But the toll that it was take, that it took on my body was also equivalent to like the high. It was just massive. After about two years, my teeth were all rotted out at the top where my gums reached the teeth. I started to have abscesses. I had nine teeth by the time I finally got sober I had nine teeth that had to be pulled because they were either broken or they were just embedded or they had like they were about to fall out because they were hanging on with nothing so after I hit that rock bottom on the island and I played my mom to come back um, I did a suboxone taper 
and after I noticed that there was a drug dealer living right down the street, I fell right back into relapse because once again, I had never dealt with the, with the trauma. I never healed from the trauma. So I finally got to my worst rock bottom that I've ever experienced in Atlanta, Georgia. We've all been threatened for front money. I was getting shot at. There were, there were dealers in the neighborhood who were actively looking for me. It was just, we are, we're very accustomed to living in fight or flight. For me, this was a, a different level of like, am I gonna die today? Am I gonna get killed today? Every single day was, can I, can I stay in an area where it's so crowded that they're not gonna shoot me in front of all these people? And I was living out of a broken down car. And every single night I was like, somebody's just gonna walk by and just shoot into the car and just kill me. And I remember I was, I was just, I started crying. I prayed to God and I was like, which I didn't do often because at that point I didn't know whether a God even existed. But I figured I would do it anyway. And I just prayed to God and I said, God, either take my life or give me strength because I can't do this anymore. Something happened to me that night. I don't know if it was God. I don't know if it was the mind state that I was in that, that triggered something. But the next morning I was like, this is it. I'm, I'm gonna call, I'm gonna call my family and ask for help for the millionth time and hope that they give me a chance or, or allow me to come and stay with them. There was something in me though that was like, I'm tired of getting sober and not staying sober. Because at this point I had gotten sober so many times, I just couldn't stay sober. Like I knew how to get sober, I just couldn't stay sober. So I started to go, so I went down and lived with my sister. She gave me a safe space and I had 30 days clean. And I told myself, you know what? I'm gonna get to the bottom of this. I'm gonna figure out why I continue to relapse, why I can get sober, but I can't stay sober. So I went down to a sober living in Savannah, Georgia. I started going to AA classes and then I started going through the steps. When I got to my fourth step, I had an epiphany. I realized why I couldn't stay sober. It was my resentments, my guilt, my shame, my fear, and my pride. I resented people for what had happened to me and the things I allowed myself to do to others. I still felt the guilt I carried from that pain and, I caused, and the pain that I caused the other children in my neighborhood. I was ashamed of who I had become I had, fe I had feared if I tried, no one would accept me or love me anyway. My pride kept me from asking for help or admitting I couldn't do it alone. I kept telling myself, I can do this alone. I got myself into this so I can get myself out. I don't need anybody's help. I can, do, I, I can figure this out on my own. I had nine months clean, but I wasn't sober. What I mean by that is that I had no substances in my body. I was abstinent, but my mentality was still that of an addict. Those neurological passages that I had built so strongly over time, my coping mechanisms were still the same. Just because I stopped using the substances didn't mean that I was gonna start doing things differently. I hadn't put in the work yet. Those same neurological passages hadn't yet started to break down because I kept telling myself, I'm an addict, I'm worthless, I will never reach what, my goals. And that is, that is what's called self-fulfilling prophecy. I don't know if you've heard of this, self-fulfilling prophecy is basically something that you, that you say out loud and you continue to think that so much that you just start to adopt what embodies whatever that is. So if I say, 
oh, I can't do that, I'm just not a very outgoing person. Then I continue to, to tell myself, well, I'm not very outgoing, so I'm not gonna go to that party, or I'm not gonna go to that social event, or whatever it is. So self-fulfilling prophecy was another thing that kept holding me back. Now, I say I was clean, but I wasn't sober, because I was leaving AA, I was literally leaving an AA meeting, I got on my motorcycle, which was uninsured, it was unregistered, it was unlicensed, I was unlicensed, and I was speeding. I was going like 123 in a 65, and I sped by a cop, and next thing you know, I'm in a full-on high-speed chase. I ended up crashing my bike, it obviously caught me, I got booked in jail, and the reason that I ran is because my habit told me, cops, run because that's the, that's the coping mechanism that I had used for that. There's the cops, run. It was just second nature, just like my habit. I ended up sitting in jail for almost 30 days before my mom bailed me out. At that point, I lost my place in sober living, so the only option I had was to return to the streets, back to what I was, the way that I was most comfortable surviving. Because at that point, I had gotten so used to surviving and thriving in the chaos, it was much easier for me to thrive in that chaos than to learn how to thrive any other way. I had become so comfortable and I was able to thrive in that life of chaos and addiction, getting sober seemed to be a much harder task than just continuing to use. Getting sober meant I had to change every single thing about me. My coping mechanisms, my relationships, the way that I look at life, every single thing about me had to change and that seemed so much harder than continuing to use. Once again, I found myself in another rock bottom. This time I was, com uh, I was contemplating a triple homicide. I was gonna kill the three people that I was with for a couple ounces of heroin. As I'm looking at the gun on the table, I see the images running through my head of how I'm gonna kill them, who I'm gonna kill first, where I'm gonna go use. And it dawned on me that killing these people would also include me having to kill my roommate. And I couldn't figure out how I would how I would get away from that, and I didn't want to end up in prison, so I was like, okay, I'm gonna go home so that I'm not with my roommate, and then I'm just gonna come back, masked up, and I'm gonna kill these guys. When I get back to my apartment, I don't know why I was frustrated, I think it was money. I threw my phone on the table, and it it bounced off the coffee table and or ricocheted and broke the TV at this place that I was crashing on the couch. So I called my mom, I called my sister, and I was like, look, you guys, like this, I broke this TV, you guys gotta help me. You know, same thing that I always did. Call my family, help their, you know, call everybody to bail me out of the situation that I put myself in. So obviously I didn't pay for the TV, they sent me the money, I didn't pay for the TV, I bought drugs. My sister saw the red flag, she was like, something's going on down there. Um, she was living in Columbus, Georgia, which was a few hours away. She drove down and she immediately saw the condition I was in and she was like, get in the car, you're obviously using, like, you're coming back home with me so that you can get back on track. You see my sister, she's five foot something, five foot like nothing, really, five foot one. <laughs> and she's sitting here telling me, get in the car, like, she's trying to like, you know, buck up to me, get in the car, you're coming home. I could have walked away, I could have overpowered her easily, but something in my mind just said, man, I'm so done. I'm so done, and I'm tired of this life, so I got in the car. For the next 60 days, I did a Suboxone taper. I started to work out. I started to build my coping mechanisms through playing video games and exercise. I got off subs, and there they were again, my traumas. I think I'm taking the steps. I think I'm doing the work, but I'm still depressed. And then I remembered my goal of figuring out why I continued to relapse. I started to go through my resentments and I started to forgive my abusers. 
I started to forgive the people that had wronged me, and then most importantly, I had to forgive myself for allowing those people to have that power over me. So I relived those moments in my life. I confronted my abuser and I forgave him. I started to make amends and apologize to the people that I had hurt. Although I wasn't able to make direct amends with some of these people, I made a promise to them and to myself that I would make amends by living the very best life that I could. Now it's all out on the table. My story is out there and I've forgiven everyone I need to forgive. I've forgiven myself. I've made amends with people I've hurt and now the work can actually begin. So now I start working on myself. My self-worth, my own happiness, my coping mechanisms, the way I feel about myself. And that meant reinventing who I am as a person. After 18 years of addiction, I didn't know who I was anymore. I didn't have any hobbies, I didn't have any goals, I didn't have any ambitions. Everything that I had uh, experienced up until that point was either driven by drugs or more so the obsession of the escape that I got from drugs. Once I started to do the work and figuring out who I am, that's when it hit me. Drugs were never the problem. The problem was me, my obsession for the need to escape my reality. Drugs will always exist. That will never change. So what I needed to change was myself. I started to heal the parts of me that craved that obsession of escape. I stopped feeling bad for what happened to me and for what I had done to other people. And I started to actually love the person that I became and the growth that I was experiencing. That obsession for the need to escape the torment started to dissipate and started to, and I started to love and cherish the time that I was able to spend by myself and use that time to work on who I wanted to be. We got till seven, right? Okay, cool. I started to gain confidence by doing things I felt good about. I was learning other coping mechanisms of dealing with my emotions through self-fulfillment. I started to be confident that just because I experienced drugs, uh, I'm sorry, just because I experienced drug abuse at a moment in my life that that wasn't my destiny. I wasn't stuck with that title of addict for life. Once an addict does not always mean always an addict. I was very fortunate that my mom gifted me with getting my teeth fixed when I had a year sober. It was something that I was very self-conscious about. I had broken teeth, the abscesses, like I said, like there was holes near my gums and I was about to lose this front tooth. And so she, I set up an appointment with my dentist and while I'm talking to my dentist, he says, do you have any drug allergies? And I immediately say, yeah, I, I'm allergic to cocaine and opiates. And every time I do those, I break out into handcuffs. <laughs> and he was like that one. And, uh, and then I remembered once an addict doesn't, always, doesn't mean always an addict. So I started to ask myself some questions because I realized for me personally, my addiction was not to the drugs. My addiction was to the obsession of escaping my reality, taking physical addiction out of the equation. So for the next 30 days, as I wait to go and get nine teeth pulled, I'm questioning myself. Should I not take the painkillers if they prescribe them to me? even though I don't have the desire to escape my reality, then I ask myself, what if I broke both of my arms in an accident? Would I still refuse the painkillers? And then I took it a step further. What if I got cancer? Would I still refuse the painkillers? So I started to use the tools that I've been given and I started to reach out and ask questions. Does taking my prescriptions take away from my sobriety? Does this mean that I lose my clean day. And I got a lot of mixed responses, but for the most part, people who had some sober time were telling me, if you're taking your prescriptions as prescribed by the doctor, you're not abusing them, then you don't lose your sobriety day. That is sober. 
if we have to take mental health medications to regulate our mental health and we take them as prescribed without abusing them, that is sobriety. So the conclusion that I came to for myself was that sobriety, for me, wasn't about the drugs, it was about making the right decision. Because if I could be prescribed to something by a doctor and not abuse it, that I'm doing what healthy, normal people do. So I realized that the neurological, but I also realized that the neurological passages that had been built through me using drugs will also try to trick me. And so I had to be very careful and analyze myself. And more importantly, be honest with myself. Am I taking the prescription in a healthy, sober way? Or is it my addiction trying to make up excuses and find ways of using drugs without being judged? The thing about being clean and sober is that the idea of what clean and sober means is different for every single person. Some people think you're not clean unless you're 100% abstinent, which means no caffeine, no nicotine, no mental health medications, no mind-altering substances whatsoever. But if you ask your sponsor if it's okay to be taking your mental health medications as prescribed, they'll most likely say you're clean. So, and they'll also probably most likely say taking your mental health medications is probably what's keeping you sober. Uh, so, I discovered something called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs, and that's what this is. So Maslow is a philosopher. He came up with this triangle that he calls the Hierarchy of Needs, and this is what he claims is necessary for every single person to, to live a fulfilling life. So you have to have your, your physiological needs, which is your food, your water, um, air. You need those things to, to breathe at a very basic level. You need those things to, to survive. Uh, the next one is safety. This is employment, your resources, your family, your health, your property, so a place to live. Uh, the next one is love and belonging, your friendships, um, your family, oh, that one was supposed to be up there, your family and your sexual intimacy. The next one is esteem, your self-esteem, your confidence, how you feel about yourself. And the top one is self-actualization, your morality, your creativity, basically your hobbies. So for me, what I realized was when I was missing one of these things, I would try and replace it with drugs. So if I had no hobbies, if I was bored, I would use drugs. I was missing this top triangle, so I would use drugs. If I didn't have any self-esteem, I had no self-worth, I tried to replace that slot with drugs. If I didn't have any kind of sexual intimacy, emotional connection, friends, or camaraderie, friend, like a friendship, I would use drugs to try and fill that gap. And the same thing with safety. If I didn't, if I didn't have my resources, I didn't have um, a job, if I was homeless, I would try and fill that gap with drugs. And every time one of these gaps was open, I would try and fill that with drugs. But sobriety doesn't start or stop with the substance. Like I mentioned earlier about me running from the police on my motorcycle, that was not a sober thought. Like, um, for me, sobriety extends further than the drugs. And that's why I say, for me, sobriety is more about making the right decisions. I took that way of thinking and started, started to apply it in every aspect of my life. My relationships, my job, the way I carry myself, and the way that I treat people. Those are all parts of being sober and making the right decision in each area of my life. This is what healthy, sober people do. I can't be clean from all substances and be beating my wife. That's not sobriety. I can't be clean from all substances and yet still thinking of how I can manipulate people or how I can lie to people, how I can get over on people, whether it's stealing something from a store or picking something up that doesn't belong to me 
those are not sober thoughts. So even if I'm abstinent, having the, doing those things is not sobriety for me. So for me, sobriety had to encompass every single thing that I stood for. I decided to reinvent who I was after re realizing I didn't know who I was. And I thought that that was beautiful, that I didn't know anything about who I was because that gave me a blank canvas to be whatever it is that I want to be. I get to just say, this is me now. And all I have to do is step into that role. I started to embody that life path. My sister introduced me to yoga and meditation. And from there, I started to dive into the world of spirituality. I started to raise my vibration, as they say. I noticed throughout my addiction, I lived on a low vibrational frequency of shame and guilt, pride, depression. And the law of attraction states, the energy you put out is the energy that you'll get back. And throughout my addiction, it was just that constant cycle of negative energy. So I said, I have to raise up out of this negative energy and raise my vibration so that I can start to attract positive things and positive people. Psychology says that we are the product of the five people we hang around the most. So I decided the people I'd like to surround myself with are successful, healthy, ambitious, and most importantly, they know who they are and they love themselves. I started to do things that made me feel good about myself and made me feel fulfilled. The obsession for the need to escape my reality started to disappear and those neurological passages just started to deteriorate. I was going through some of my old clothes and I got, I started going through some of my old clothes and I found a needle of heroin in one of my old jackets. I had like three months sober at this point. And my heart jumped. It was the first time I had been face to face with the substance that granted me that escape that I had been chasing for so long. I was living with my sister and her husband, but they were away for the week. I had the whole house to myself. And those neurological passages said, dude, you could use, nobody's home. They're not gonna be back for a few days. Nobody will ever know. You can just continue this lie. You can just don't tell anybody and you don't have to change your sobriety date. You don't have to like feel any shame or any guilt about it. You can just use right now and everything will be fine. But my other coping mechanisms, the other neurological passages said, that's not us anymore. So I took the last step and I broke up with my addiction as if she was the love of my life. I looked at the needle in my hand and I told her all the things that I wanted to say. I fucking hate you. I hate the things you've made me do. I hate what you've done to me and everything you've taken from me. My relationships, my looks, my possessions, and most of all, my dignity. You've hurt me time and time again, emotionally, physically, spiritually. You've abused me and hurt me You've taken everything that I've had, not only that, but your promise that you can make everything better was never fulfilled. You've only taken from me and gave me nothing but temporary escape. In turn, making it much harder to live a fulfilling life and kept me in constant fear of never being good enough on my own. I never want to see you again, and I flushed it. I cried as if I broke up with the love of my life. It took a lot of strength, it took a lot of confidence that everything will be okay if I just let go. I took that confidence and I ran with it. A month later, I find myself in a trip across America with my sister. We're in a nightclub, we're having a good time. And one of the people that we just randomly met, we just met so many people, just one of these guys really liked our vibe and he was like, hey, you want to you want a bump of coke and there again my heart skipped a beat the neurological passages those residual neurological passages said hey that's 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 what we like remember like that gave us this that made us feel like we could just talk you know hours and hours and in that moment, 
it was like it was it was exactly as if my ex just walked through the door and I was and I almost contemplated I contemplated doing it you know those residual those residual neurological passages were like hey that's what we're used to free code we never say no to code well, it's free <laughs> you know so in that split moment, the residual neurological passages made my heart skip a beat, just like my ex walked in after I told her I never want to see her again. But there she was right in front of me, begging me to take her back. And in that moment, I remembered how amazing we were together. The butterflies she gave me, the warmth I felt, the escape that I was given. And in that moment, I almost took her back. And then the reality set in. All those emotions were alive. The pain that she caused me, the abuse, the suffering, the dignity that she took, layer by layer. The confidence came over me. I love myself. And I don't need her to give me that fake love. I found someone else, and her name is Life. I love my life now, and I love what I've accomplished and how far I've come. I'm not willing to give that up for a temporary high. So I said, no, bro, I'm okay. I'm actually in recovery. And he turned to me and for a moment he couldn't speak. His eyes got all watery and he said, bro, I'm so sorry. I'm so proud of you and I'm actually struggling real hard to quit myself. And I started to explain a little bit about how I just didn't have the desire to use drugs anymore. Because I love who I am. Those drugs just aren't gonna solve my problems like I had hoped. And now the appeal in escape just isn't there because I love who I am. And then I yelled out to my sister, Olive, I said no to Coke. Mm -hmm. And she screamed from across the room, Yeah, I'm so proud of you. Mm -hmm. And that moment, that moment, I got this rush of dopamine this high that I've never gotten from any drug. This like sense of accomplishment that I was like, holy shit, like I can do this. Oh, two minutes. On the rest of that trip across America, my sister and I were offered coke at least four or five more times. And those neurological passages just kept deteriorating every time I said no and that rush of adrenaline and that self-confidence that I started to build was, was building stronger neurological passages, stronger than the ones that were deteriorating from constant addiction. To be the best version of myself that I can be, it's a work in progress, and every day is a life lesson of what, I, of what works and what doesn't. How we combat our obsession through self-fulfillment and confidence. Today I live a beautiful life because I live in high vibration frequency and I turn negatives into positives. I make the right decisions even when those decisions are not easy to make. I strive to be the best version of myself that I can be and embody the canvas that I've painted. Now I stand before you a completely different man than I was three years ago. I don't claim to have it all figured out. I don't think that my path is the one true path. I don't think that there's only one path to recovery. I'm only sharing my strength experience at home. Before I go, I'd like to leave you with this quote from a very wise man. We now know the time has come when the tired old lie of once an addict, always an addict, will no longer be tolerated by society or the addict himself. We do recover. And that's a quote directly from Bill Wilson himself. And that's it. Thank you very much.